about the Gideons, but uh, you probably heard some some new things or was reminded of some things this morning. The one that uh, new one is that new for me is that we can buy Bibles. So uh, if you become a Gideon friend, uh, like Larry said, there's information out there on the uh, for you for you to look at that and uh, and and help the Gideons. And one thing I've always been uh, impressed by is that uh, every penny goes to buy Bibles, that the men who are Gideons uh, actually pay a fee to be a Gideon, not only give their time and go and all that, but they pay money to support their organization. So that speaks well of a group of men to, to do that, that uh, they're that uh, concerned about getting the Word of God out. So thank you, Larry, for coming this morning. And uh, you have the opportunity to give to this ministry this morning as you leave. Just put your money in the offering plate. You didn't think you was getting out early this morning or anything, did you? Romans chapter 12. So if you'll turn to Romans 12, we're really just going to look at uh, one verse today. I knew Brother Larry would be coming, so I cut it way down. But uh, you know how one verse can lead into lots of other verses and that sort of thing. So, uh, uh, Brother Larry, we've been in this study now all of last year. <laughs> uh, we took a couple of little breaks, but we're to Romans chapter 12, uh, just verse by verse study of the of the book of Romans. Romans 12, verse 9. Well, the, the title is Love in Action. Uh, let's talk about that just a moment. Love in Action. Love is action. Uh, there is no love without showing some action to someone. Uh, take your pick. Whatever, however you're showing love, there has to be love's a verb. You've heard that, I think, before, that uh, uh, love is showing some uh, expression to someone else. We're here in the, in the book of uh, uh, Romans where chapter 12, as I've already preached this, the third message now, you know it's a transition chapter. It's transitioning from all the doctrine of what Christ has done for you and I by dying on the cross, and then that great passage where he transitions in chapter, uh, in verses 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, he says. When, when we stop and consider what God has done for us, it's only reasonable that we would want to serve him. And then verse 2 is what uh, he, I think, is the key verse to understanding what he's doing in the rest of the book of Romans, here in chapter 12 through chapter 16, where he's going to start talking more about our behavior uh, rather than our beliefs. Our beliefs is what's driving our behavior. And he says, do not be conformed to this world. Well, of course, that's what this world is trying to do. This, the whole world system, uh, the secular world as we call it, uh, the goal is to make us all conform, to get in line, to, uh, to, to go along with, to, uh, to agree with. The abortion industry out there thinks that they have the right to exist, and we as Christians should all be just fall in line in the, the whole gay agenda today and all of that and uh, you know we get uh, nauseated at some of the things we hear but uh, then they come right back and can't believe that uh, we can't just accept all that and and uh, just conform that's uh, that's what the world wants us to do but Paul says but rather be transformed be transformed by the renewing of your mind Brother Larry, the Word of God is what renews our mind, isn't it? And that's why it's so important to get the Word of God out there. And Romans 10, as you quoted, read earlier about faith comes by hearing, and we, uh, we, our, our minds are renewed by the Holy uh, Scriptures, by the Holy Spirit, and so that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And then he launched into what it means to have spiritual gifts so that we're all different. He's writing to the Roman church, both Jews and Gentiles, and uh, he, they're all different. They're coming from different backgrounds, and a lot of Paul's writings uh, follow this same uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, 
methodology here where he talks about belief first and then he talks about uh, behavior. But here he's talking to the church. And then also, as last week, I went into Romans, I mean, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we see a pattern. The 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 is really the same pattern that Paul is using right here in Romans 12, where he talked about all the spiritual gifts and the body being one, and we're all part of that body. But then he ends chapter 12 with the verse, but I show you a more excellent way. And when he ends that verse, then he jumps right into uh, the love chapter, of which we're going to look at in just a moment. Uh, but uh, the pattern that he's using is that he wants us to know uh, beliefs. He wants us to know doctrine. And then he comes in with this idea of how we're all part of a body, how we're all uh, united in Christ. We're all different. We're different members. But then our diversity comes together for unity in the, in the body but then both in Romans uh, 12 here and in 1 Corinthians 13, here, here's his transition from that. In both cases, it's love. And this is the only verse we'll look at this morning from Romans 12. Let love be without hypocrisy. He could have went any number of ways. Let love be without pride. Let love be without anger I mean he could have done a lot of things but he he said let love be without hypocrisy there was a statement I mean there was a kind of a saying in the Williams household growing up uh, growing the kids up that uh, when they went off to the business world and so forth and that was to fake it till you make it well that works okay in some circles but that should not be the Christian's attitude toward life uh, we don't want to fake it till we make it. We don't want to be hypocrites. Let love be without hypocrisy. And then he adds two more statements. Abhor. Abhor what's evil. Many of your Bibles say hate. In fact, about all of your Bibles is going to say that other than uh, King James and, well, and New King James maybe. NASB, and uh, are you reading NASB? NASB and New King James is the only two I found that uses the word uh, hypocrisy and uses the word uh, abhor. Abhor, okay. NIVs don't say uh, hate, and several others will say hate, which hate is the emotion. But abhor is a little different word. In fact, it's the only time the Greek New Testament Bible uses this word. Abhor is hatred with a pushback. It's, it's to be aghast at, uh, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's to just abhor it. It's, you know, it's to, to be aghast at, at what you've just uh, uh, heard, uh, be, a, be aghast at what's it, push back against evil, don't just hate it, but, but turn from it, and then cling is the whole separate, I mean, it's a 180 difference, isn't it, from a push back to a pull to you, to a, to a cling to what is good, and those two things following the fact that he just said, let love be without hypocrisy, is, uh, uh, is quite important in the context that he's using it here. Let love be without hypocrisy. Don't fake it till you make it. But abhor, hate that which is evil and cling to what is good. So let love be without hypocrisy. Uh, your Bibles are going to say uh, sincere or genuine. I think the New Living Translation says don't pretend. I think the message says don't fake it. Don't fake it. Don't pretend. Rather be sincere. Be, be genuine. Because the actual word here, you'll hear the word uh, hypocrite in here. The actual Greek word is hypocrites. I know you wanted to know that this morning, but it's hypo or hypo maybe, but hypocrites. 
In the hypocrite in the Greek world, the Roman world, was the actor. And the actor would get up on stage and he would have a mask in front of him. You've seen those old Shakespearean kind of plays. And that mask could be uh, a big smiley face. Or it could be a real sad face. It could be tears. Uh, that mask could be whatever that actor was trying to portray. But the actor behind the mask could have been mad, sad, glad, whatever. He was wearing a mask he w- or holding a mask, and that was the hypocrite. That was the actor. Well, that's the very word that got pulled into the, to the New Testament as to let love be without a mask because we can all wear the mask, can't we? We can all be smiles and everything's just right and we can be dying behind the mask. Or we can be all smiley and happy and be, uh, their, their time's coming. Yeah, they don't get what they deserve, you know. You, just, uh, you can have anything going on behind the mask, can't you? And that's what Paul is saying. Don't let your love be that way. In fact, Jesus burnt the Pharisees over this issue. I mean, the strongest language in the New Testament was when Jesus burnt the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23. Jesus never burnt the sinners, and I mean burnt in the sense of of a strong language condemning them to hell or whatever. He always taught them, and he always turned turned the um, message to repentance. Don't stay in the sin. But he went and ate, and that's what they criticized him for. He ate with Zacchaeus. He ate with with Matthew. He ate with the sinners. But, boy, his strongest language was reserved for the religious crowd because they were all wearing masks. Their mask was that they were godly and holy and everything was great, but behind it, listen to what he says in Matthew 23, verse 13. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees. Hypocrites, you mask wearers. For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourself, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses for pretense, make long prayers, therefore you will receive greater condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourself. And that's real obvious to understand. We see that in the Mormons and the Jehovah Witnesses today. Man, once those missionaries convert someone to Jehovah's Witness or Mormon, it's almost impossible to to talk to them, to convert them back to true Christianity because they've been brainwashed they've been made a proselyte verse 16 woe to you you blind guides when I was reading that and you know my mind sometimes just goes crazy and I mentioned that to you but I read that and for some reason I just uh, uh, a thought came over me that made me kind of laugh to myself actually Uh, it's not a laughing kind of a verse but it's just woe to you you blind guides And the thought that came to me, I actually called David Brown to see if he would let me say this this morning. And you know how easy going David is. So he said, yeah, you can can do that. It it won't uh, matter to me. So David, raise your hand back there. Maybe everybody don't know David Brown and Janie Brown. But, uh, uh, you know, David loves to ski. And maybe that's what brought it to mind was the fact that he just got back from a ski trip. And so I called him and was talking to him and telling him, Uh, about the message this morning but the thought that came to me was that here David is tethered or tied to a guide and they're headed off down the mountain skiing and all of a sudden one of these spruce uh, snow-filled limbs slaps him right in the face and he looks over at his guide and he says uh, as I would have well did you not see that tree (laughs) and uh, and the guide says no I thought you were the guide I'm blind 
Now, at that moment, that wouldn't have been a good situation, would it? And uh, David went on to tell me, he said, well, I did have a, a roommate one time that was legally blind, and he kept wanting me to go skiing with him. And I said, I think I'll pass on that. <laughs> and he said one time he was skiing down a hill, and he could tell that it started snowing really hard. And all of a sudden, his guide stopped him, and he said, man, it is snowing so hard. I can't even see the trail. And David said, well, can you see the pose? He said, I can't even see my hand in front of my face. <laughs> and so at that point, it would have been the blind leading the blind, David, wouldn't it, going down that hill. And he said, we just had to go very slowly to, to, to get down the hill. But I don't know why that popped into my mind. But that would not be a good situation. And in fact, to, to have a blind guide would be worse than no guide. Because as David's already said, he passed on the on the the one guy. It's, it's better to just be safe in your cabin than to, than to have a blind guy that might lead you right off a cliff to, uh, if you were following him. But woe to you! That's what Jesus is saying. He's saying this to the religious crowd. He's saying this to quote the churchgoers. But he's saying you're wearing a mask and you're leading people wrongly. Blind guides, he says, you strain in a gnat and swallow a camel. And I'll drop on down, verse 28 says, Even so outwardly you appear righteous to men, but inside you're full of hypocrisy. You're wearing a mask. And Jesus really burnt that group for that. And so Paul has picked up on a word that the Greek world uh, would have known very, uh, would have been very familiar with and this word hypocrites, wearing a mask was the exact opposite of being genuine or being sincere. So church, he's saying, don't wear a mask. Let your love for others, and he's don't, and he's don't use this to talk about love of brotherly love as well as loving your enemies so let's back up and look at the word love a moment let love the greek language has three words for love it has the word phileo which uh, philadelphia uses as the city of brotherly love and in the very next verse paul is going to talk about brotherly love he's going to talk about how that we as uh, church members should love our brothers but then as you drop on down in this same, in chapter 12, he's going to talk about loving our enemies, loving those who persecute us. So he's setting the scene with some very strong language. This agape love, not only toward our church members, which that would be a little re more readily understood, but also this agape, unconditional love toward those who persecute us, toward our enemies, as Jesus would say. And that would have not been easy for that uh, culture to understand any more than it is for our culture to understand. Phileo is the word for, for love of brother or love of fishing or love of just whatever. It's, it's love of a puppy. Uh, eros is the Greek word that we get sexual love from, erotica, uh, erotica or that type of, of uh, love. But the agape love, which has only been mentioned so far four times in the book of Romans, all about God's love. And if we go all the way back to John 3.16, it's for God so loved, you know, the world. They gave his only begotten son. That's, that's our word here. That's agape love. That's love unconditional. That's the love Abraham had for God that enabled him to give his only son. So we're talking about the strongest of loves. And he's going to talk about it in the context of our church members, our brothers. That's where we just come out of this one body thing. And then that of our enemy. I have it on the slides, I think, so look at with me, or you can turn to 1 Corinthians 13. I read these first three verses last week, but I didn't read the others. Because again, the, the, Paul's using the same pattern. 
that of addressing the issue, that of then telling us that we're all the same yet different. We're part of one body, but we're different members. But no matter how gifted we are, here's a church family. Listen to what he says. If I could speak all the language of earth and, and angels, but didn't agape love. That's what he uses all through 1 Corinthians 13. But I didn't love unconditionally. I didn't love others unconditionally. I would only be a noisy, I'd just be a, a, a bunch of racket. And if I had the gift of prophecy and I understood all the God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge and, and had faith and I could move mountains, but I didn't love others, I didn't love others unconditionally, I, that all wouldn't matter. I'd be nothing. If I gave everything I have to take care of the poor and even sacrifice my body, I could boast about it. Boy, look what I did. But if I didn't love others unconditionally, I would have gained nothing. And then look what he says. Love is patient. This unconditional agape love is patient and it's kind. It's not jealous. It's not boastful. It's not proud. It's not rude. It does not demand its own way. It's not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wrong. This kind of love does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. It never loses faith. It's always hopeful and it endures through every circumstance. And he ends this chapter with, now these three abide, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest is love. For if we do all these things, in the context here of, uh, of both Corinthians and Romans, especially back in Romans 12. After all that we've heard about what Christ has done, after we've learned about who we are in Christ, how blessed we are, then we're being challenged, exhorted to go forth into a world and show the love of God to the rest of the world. Warren Wiersbe comments, uh, on these verses uh, in 1 Corinthians where it's talking about all the parts of the body. He adds, love is the circulatory system which enables all the members to function in a he healthy, harmoni harmoni harmonious way. I like that. You have all the parts of the body, but drain the blood out of them, you got nothing, right? And he just tied that all together, that love is the blood that uh, gives life to, to the body. And so it shouldn't be a surprise to us that when Paul lists the spiritual fruits, the uh, fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5.22, guess what the very first one is? You know it, right? What is it? It's love. So much in Scripture talks about love. When Jesus was asked what was the great commandment, you remember, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And the second one's main is uh, namely like it. Love your enemy as yourself. And all the law and the prophets hang on these two statements. Love the Lord your God with everything that's in you. And in next chapter, chapter 13, we're going to hear Paul say, Owe oh, oh nothing to anyone except to what? Somebody tell me. Owe oh, no one anything except to love them. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. And John talked about a lot about love. You say you love you, you love God and you hate your brother, you know what you are? You're a liar, he said. 
How can you love uh, God who whom you've not seen if you don't love your brother whom you have seen? So we look through the New Testament and we see a lot about the agape love. And in this one verse, back up to that one verse, Kelly, all the way back to Romans 12. There you go. Let love, agape love, be without a mask, period. Let agape love, let your unconditional love be genuine. Let it be sincere. Don't fake it. Don't make it up. Let it be real. As he's going on to talk about love of your, of your brother and love of your enemy. But he's not through. He mentions two other things that really bring about what holy living is all about. Love your neighbor and hate sin. Love your neighbor. Abhor what is evil. If we're loving God, here, here's one of the, the keys to understanding what loving God's all about. Because so many in our world today and in our life today, right here starting in the pulpit and all of us, we don't normally think that my sin is, is pushing back against my love for God. But it is. Because my sin in my life is, is, is saying that I love my sin. I love what I love. I want to do what I want to do. And in the moment, God's taking second place to that. And that hits all of us. That hits right here. That hit Paul when Paul said in, in uh, Romans um, 7, the things that I want to do I don't do and the things I don't want to do I find myself doing because I'm still a human I'm still in this flesh and I still have that old nature that old calling that's not dead yet but let but let love let my agape love be without hypocrisy push back against evil and cling to what is good. Sacrificial. Back to verse 1 and 2. Sacrificial. Transformed living. Calls us. Demands. That we love others. Unconditionally. That's a mouthful. Did you get all that? Probably should have put that on the screen. You need to write that down. That's what he's saying in these first, uh, what, uh, uh, 15 verses or so. Sacrificial, that's what he's called us to do, to lay our life on the, on the altar. Transformed by the renewing of our mind. And now he's saying to do that, to push back against evil, to cling to what's good requires us to love unconditionally. And that's the hardest thing there is in the Christian life. Jesus said something that sounds like uh, it, it wasn't new because a lot have already been said about loving. But Jesus himself said in John 13, 34, a new commandment, talking to his disciples, a new commandment I give to you, that you love agape unconditionally, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. First John says, we know that we have passed out of death into life. It's, it's, a, it's a way we can have assurance of our salvation. Because we love the brethren, he who does not love abides in death. So some very uh, pointed subject this morning. One that we, you know, it's easy to just talk about love, 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 love everything, love everybody. But agape love is far different. And 
we're going to see he's going to address that even more next week as we go on into how we, sh how we show that to others, show hospitality, uh, just the different things he's going to list down through there is how we show our love for our brothers and even for our enemies. Let's bow for prayer.